welcome to the Parts Cast. We've got a really great episode for you today. We're talking to Chef Frank Barrett Mills from Middleby, and we're really going to talk about how bars, pubs, small scale restaurants can think about bringing a food program in. What type of equipment? What are some considerations? It was a great conversation, a lot of fun because let's face it, food is fun. But before we jump into the conversation, I really want to tell you about Tech Town. Have you ever been frazzled by a fryer, or wondering about a walk-in? Well, Tech Town is the place for you. If you're a service technician and you've got questions, there's a community to ask, share, and repair. That's techtownforum.com. So if you've got a question about food service equipment, techtownforum.com is the place to go. Let's cue the music. Welcome to the Parts Cast. And today we're looking at changes occurring across bars and pubs and many smaller restaurants as a result of the pandemic. And really, you know, we're looking at success by addition. You know, for so long we've been talking about the real negative impacts that the pandemic has been having on food service. But, you know, there are a lot of establishments out there that have been creative, have been bringing, you know, new ways of thinking to adapt to what the pandemic has brought to the industry to ensure success today, but really also helping them set themselves up for the future. So joining us on the Parts Cast is Chef Frank Barrett Mills with Middleby. He's here to discuss those topics and more. So Frank, welcome to the Parts Cast. Well, thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. And yeah, the Restaurant industry, pars and pubs have really taken a beating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and, you know, as, as, as we've discussed in prior conversations, you know, food is a, a, a comfort. Food is a socializer. Food is, is the, the like sun for our soul when, when it comes to nourishment. So finding ways to help these establishments be successful in the future really is a benefit, not is it's a benefit for all of us. So really, before we dive into the conversation, you know, for our listeners who haven't met you, seen your videos, run across you at, a, at, a, at an event trade show, uh, read your blog, Hot Chef 911. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, my name is synonymous with culinary pyrotechnics. <laughs> um, uh, I've been in the industry for about 50 years now. Um, you, if you're able to go to my website, it will document where I've been, what I've done. But basically, I've been producing love in the, in the <laughs> shape of food for uh, a long time. Uh, with uh, Middleby and previous to that, Standex, uh, been supplying food as a manufacturer chef. Uh, have worked with Mercy Chefs for many years. And if you're not familiar with Mercy Chefs, look it up on the internet. It's a group that runs into disasters while everybody is running the other way. We've served over four and a half million meals to disasters in the last four years. And uh, we produce a great meal for folks that really need um, food and more importantly, need a soul warmer. And we have been very successful with it. I am certified with ACF and all the other things that go along with it. But most importantly, I love what I do. I love supplying food to people. And please check out some of the videos and alike online, and you'll see uh, the story clearly. But anyways, uh, (laughs) big flavors, uh, great products, table design, plate design. Those are my signatures. And really just, you know, caring about the people that you're, you're, you're delivering meals to as well. It's again, food, food can be a healer. And in times like this, healing is, is, is a great, is a great, uh, great talent to have for, for, for everybody. Um, so again, welcome to the, welcome to the parts cast and, you. you know, I want this to be a positive conversation. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about the pandemic where we're seven months in, you know, un- uncertainty is still sort of the guiding principle uh, with, with everything as we see, you know, cities and states opening, closing, opening, closing. And 
with part of that, you know, when we talk about food service, restaurants always seem to be the headliner in in conversations around food service. But bars and pubs, you know, are equally important to our social well-being, our social nature as as individuals, if only to go, you know, have a quick conversation with a with a friend or watch a watch a sporting event. Why, Frank, why have these types of establishments beyond, you know, restaurants taken such a, an, an abundantly of large hit because of the pandemic? Well, if you look at it from just the pub itself, the whole environment of pubs is to be close, communicate, um, elbow to elbow. The traditionally smaller locations are usually dimly lit. They're, they serve a full line of liquors and the like. Um, a lot of them don't serve food or very, very small amount of food. So it's been a challenge to be able to stay and keep that concept going. Uh, when I walk into a pub, my blood pressure goes down about 30 degrees. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the right place to be, but it's difficult in these times with a six-foot spread and masks and like, it's very hard to drink down a Guinness stout with a mask on and it's not great with a straw. So <laughs> it's, it's a difficult thing. And if you think about a restaurant, you're sitting across a table that you will be probably four to five feet separate to begin with. And that's a lot easier, but that isn't, and restaurants are great, but the pub and the bar produces a relaxed atmosphere that a restaurant traditionally doesn't. So people let their guard down, they take the masks off, they drink a couple of beers, have some great laughs, scream about sporting events if it's uh, on the TV there. So it does does really challenge all of the rules of the pandemic. But given that that's the case, um, the pubs have taken a hit because a lot of states are requiring pubs to serve 50% of their total sales in foods. Well, it's really hard to get that dollar return on nachos and a frozen pizza. It's really duff difficult to reach 50% of total sales in that condition. And that's a prerequisite to open in a lot of places. So that's been a real challenge. Restaurants don't have to deal with that. Restaurants open. There is no measure of what percentages of food they're serving to their liquors, but bars and pubs and breweries, and let's not forget breweries, big part of the business, are held to a, a little higher standard. And that's tough for them to meet. And, and why is that? Why, why is there such a, a standard difference between those types of establishments and traditional restaurants? Well, the consumption of alcohol in a bar, pub, or brewer, brewery is going to be higher traditionally than a restaurant. And in that, as we relax and get comfortable, a lot of the rules seem to break down. And I'm not saying being drunk in any means, but just three or four drinks re relaxes you to the point where you have a tendency to drop your guard somewhat. In restaurants, it's a more formal situation. You have a table between you. When you sit at a pub, at a bar, you're elbow to elbow within inches of the next person who you may not know or you may know, could be great friends, but you have no idea what the, the carrier situation is. But in restaurants, it's a lot more separative than uh, than the pub, the bar, or the brewery. So I think that's the measure of it. And then the consideration of food leads to an area that may be a little bit larger, a little bit more spread out. It may be a table. There's more going on. There's blotters being consumed. So the alcohol content and the effect on the body is different. So if you're just drinking, it's different from a drinking and food uh, consumption. And the ability to control via the food will slow down the absorption of alcohol and the like, and there'll be less of that, that breakdown. I don't agree with it, by the way, Eric, but that's the ruling. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, it definitely, you know, feels like there's a, there's a bar to hit and the pandemic is, has challenged uh, these operators to, to find new ways to, 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 just survive really. And, right. you know, when we think about having to have 50% of your revenue come from food, you know, what types of changes can these establishments make to, 
redefine or, you know, hit those checkpoints in the near term, but also, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, create a potentially bigger success, you know, moving forward as restrictions relax a little bit, or we get back to whatever we establish as life post pandemic. (laughs) <laughs> the new norm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a scary thought. But uh, <laughs> pubs and bars and breweries have a real challenge. And short term, uh, we've come up with some simple solutions for that, looking at simple equipment that can operate without hoods, because a lot of those locations don't have food service. They're very small. They may have only a microwave. Mm-hmm. Um, so, short term to respond to the ability to deliver food in simple form with simple purchases of equipment and actually doing shopping at supermarkets or could be a restaurant depot, but not hooking up with a major supplier at this point until they're ready to do that. And the ready to do that point would be when their sales are starting to boom. You understand it's going to, there's a curve here. They're going to start offering food. And it's going to take a while to catch on and it's going to be slow and they don't want a case of this, a case of that. We found that a lot of bars that start up go to supermarkets to buy their food products, one or two cans of this, one or two pounds of that. And they can they can get away with the startup. So anyways, back to the 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 challenges, Um, equipment. And I'll give you an idea of what we put together. And uh, I have. 36 videos coming up online Monday with uh, Middleby through the APW Baker's Pride and Star Holdings Group. Um, Sandwiches and foodstuffs that can be produced without hoods with an investment of very little money on the equipment, all countertop, all without a hood that can produce great food. And uh, the piece of equipment we chose were a panini grill, sandwich grill, a waffle iron. People say waffle iron. You'd be surprised how much stuff you can produce on a waffle iron. Some of the best churros known to man come out of waffle <laughs> iron. Uh, stuffed waffles with with uh, pizza makings, mm-hmm. uh, a uh, Philly steak waffle. Some And these aren't eaten with ma- maple syrup. They're sliced into almost like a breadstick. So you can produce great stuff there. The ability to produce pizza, which is the number two bar food, um, with a small countertop. And I'll mention the P-Series with with Baker's Pride. It can plug into 120 volt. It can do uh, par-baked and frozen pizzas with no problem at all. And then, obviously, a microwave if they have it. With those pieces of equipment, you can produce a ton of food, and I don't mean lesser quality. You can produce with a good menu, a good recipe. I mean, the sandwiches you're going to see produced in a lot of the uh, the recipes and videos that are going up Monday are sandwich based. There are some that are, you know, like uh, chicken uh, uh, kebabs and some pates and stuff. But the majority of them are really simple, great quality, bar quality sandwiches that are produced great on the panini grill and and sandwich grill. And the kick is it shows you how to do it, how to do it safely. And more importantly, we eat with our eyes, our nose, our hands. We feel in so many different senses what food's all about. This teaches you how to dress a plate simply to produce a real bang to your customer and the flavors, as I said, culinary pyrotechnics. That's my game. <laughs> well, and the what flavors I what, are huge. And, and, and what I really love, awesome. and what I really love about it is there's not a fryer involved. You know, so when we think there's about not a fryer food, at all, we're yeah. always thinking about oh, it's French fries, it's cheese sticks, it's you know chicken wings. This is this is you know food, and you know if we've if we've learned anything, you know, in the data these these last you know number of months, sandwiches are a a no you know a real top selling item, you know. So you t- you talked a little bit about the you know some of the types of sandwiches. What else What else do you have coming from a from a recipe perspective that I think listeners can get excited about? And I also want to clarify: Monday is October nineteenth. You know, so for everybody listening, 
This podcast will probably go up after that. So when you go, when you hear it, run to the site and see see Chef Frank and all the food pyrotechnics he's bringing to life. <laughs> well, we've got desserts um, in any one of the the pieces of equipment, doing you know brownies on waffle irons. Uh, you know, coming into the holidays, there's nothing better than a stuffing waffle dressed with sliced turkey and it can be bought in the deli and making a sandwich from that is unbelievable so you get your stuffing you get your uh, you get your turkey you get your gravy and a little cranberry sauce in there and you've got a meal there and it can be eaten by hand and that's the thing it's it's about all the the touch feel smell and these these are really important um right now people want to get down to the basics i mean and no offense to French cuisine, but I wouldn't want to be a restaurant in French cuisine right now because people want reasonably priced, fresh, produced on site, not frozen. And no offense to frozen products. Everybody has to use them from time to time. But all of the recipes we're producing can be purchased in your local farm stand or your local supermarket and bought in small quantities and be delivered fresh and crisp. And it's so important. The flavors are outrageous. I mean, how much better than a freshly grilled uh, thin sliced steak with real cheese on it and sauteed onions as a Philly cheesesteak produced in your location on a panini machine. I mean, these are simple things. And the tricks that we talk about are are really important to add to the flavor. And as I said, plate decoration is so important. Good pickles, good olives, you know, using kale, uh, using from the deli coleslaws, colorful coleslaws, using other products that are, are already made but are fresh. They're not frozen. And they add so much. Adding coleslaw to a Reuben on the, on the, on the griddle on a uh, panini machine and dressing it correctly with the right kind of mustard and more importantly, buying good bread. Yep. And as, as you see these videos, you'll note that every one of them starts with bread is the center of this. That is the star. Yeah. And well, you and, have to get good bread. Yeah. And so many local, local grocery stores or local farm stands or, you know, smaller, smaller outlets in, you know, across the country have, you know, really good bakeries have popped up to get back to a lot of the, sure. the real, you know, traditional breads that, you know, we've, we forgot about, you know, over the, over the, over the years. Cause that's one of the other things that I really like about what you're proposing and, you know, what you're bringing to life is from a supply chain perspective, you can go to your local markets and find this stuff. You don't need to get into a, Oh, you know, you've got your U.S. Foods or your Cisco truck or your DFS truck pulling up every morning. It's really about, all right, I got to go and get to the grocery store because this is what I'm going to make today. Here's the five menu items that I want to put on them on the menu because it also you know, creates you know a variability that a lot of places don't normally take into account. They get locked into a menu. So again, there's even, you can bring people back in because it's like, what are we cooking today? You right. know? It pulls them back in, definitely. And some of the most exciting times for me have been in the morning, very early to walk into either a farmer's market or into a supply house and picking the products I want to serve that day and seeing what's available and what's fresh. And you do that, you go back and one of your folks there, you tell them what you got, you print up the menu for the day quickly, you get it online quickly. People look for new, fast, good quality food. And that's one way to do it. But you can say, I bought the lettuce from uh, Henry's Farm and I, I bought the, uh, the pork from wherever. Yep. You're, you're showing the support of local businesses, which has been forgotten for a long time. And no offense to Cisco and U.S. Foods and CNS, they've supported me over the years. But it's not about buying case lots of canned product. It's about buying separate quality ingredients, producing quality products locally purchased that supports 
the market that you're in. And I can't tell you how important that is and how many people appreciate that. And the suppliers, how they take great care of you knowing you're doing that. So, uh, you know, partnerships, uh, talking to farms in your area. And the only caveat to that is just making sure that they're certified. They can supply products to you that are safe. Yeah, no. And I think that's one of the things, too, that, you know, as a, as a country, we've gotten so used to having everything available year round. I, you know, I love this idea of being able to say if I'm in the Midwest, there's a growing season. You know, it really brings back some of the seasonality of sure. what foods could be, should be, which then re- reinforces the freshness and the, the locality of it. So for some of for some of our listeners, you know, who are bar and pub owners, any any sort of quick tips on when they're buying produce or buying, you know, uh, you know, meats and things like that, that they should look at, you know, as they're bringing stuff in, because obviously this is probably not something they do on a regular basis or, and they certainly don't do it on a regular basis for a larger audience. Right. Exactly. And the audience is going to grow first of all. So there are two steps here. They're preparing to respond to where they are right now. And long-term, if they develop this correctly, they will have to add kitchen equipment and other things to, to grow that business. But, um, they're setting the hook right now for that, uh, the re-entry, and as my PSA says, uh, you know, get prepared, dream big, your day will come again, and that is true. And we know that the business will come back at some point, and you got to be ready for it. But in the interim, the simple stuff is important. And you asked a couple of things that mm-hmm. owners should look at. Refrigeration is really important, and serve safe. Uh, which is an important part of uh, keeping food safe. Uh, Hazard analysis, critical control points, which is deep for most pub people. I won't get into that. Bottom line is everything has to be below 41 degrees or above 165 and to hold 135 or above. But hopefully the pubs are not thinking about and and the bars and the the, uh, breweries are not thinking about holding. They're producing immediate food to be delivered quickly to their customers, which gives it the freshest, best flavors. So refrigeration is one of the important things. Secondarily is the the ability to sanitize and make sure your production areas are safe for doing what you're trying to do. And that's something that is new for bars and restaurants, I should say pubs and, and breweries. They know how to handle uh, their heads for beer and they know how to handle glassware and the like, but a production site for food has to be sanitized and there are rules uh, that have to be followed and they're not rules for the fun of it. They're rules to protect their customers and also their employees. Simple training is utmost important because you may have servers who are going to be pressed into doing food in a situation where you've never done it before. So they'll fall back on, well, it's the way I do it at home. Put the brakes on, guys. This is not about serving your kids a peanut butter sandwich. This is about serving products that have to be refrigerated correctly, brought to correct temperatures, and are and have to be served not on a white plate. Thank you very much. Here's a, here's a uh, Wonder Bread sandwich. Uh, and no offense to Wonder Bread because I grew up one, but <laughs> there has to be more. And that is a learning curve that videos like mine and there are there is access to me through my blog and we help whomever calls, whoever sends information, we'll help you. And there's no charge for that service. Um, we're paying back for 50 years of great success. So, and I've got 27 chefs around the country, seven of which work directly with me often that will help me to answer questions. So I've got bodies all over the place and we can help you. But uh, that's what the blog is there for. But training, food safety, and refrigeration are probably the top three things that I'd want to talk to uh, pubs, bars, and breweries. And when I say refrigeration, it can't be in the same cooler as any raw, raw products. You can't put a pound of hamburger right next to something you're not going to cook. So 
those you have to think about those and there are rules if you go on to the nra serve safe site it will show you how to stack your cooler uh, to show you what products are at the top and what are at the bottom and uh, so following those rules or asking someone and you know, most of the restaurants know it. And if you have a relationship with a restaurant, ask one of them because they've had to follow it. And you're new in the game. You're newbies. Yeah. And so you talked about Surf Safe. Can you explain a little bit more about that program and sure. uh, your your role in it? Because I, I, I know you've got a, a an active, you're an active participant. Right. Oh, definitely. Um, Surf Safe is an adjunct to a HACCP program. And let me talk about SurfSafe first, and then I'll get into HACCP. SurfSafe is NRA's program on food safety. And you take a test after a study uh, for operators, meaning the, the wait staff in the restaurant. There are operator tests and there are manager tests for the managers and alike of the restaurant. There's two different levels. And there is no cost at this time due to the pandemic with NRA. You can taste these exams. There's, uh, there's a primer for the operators, the employees for producing food and talk about safety and you get a uh, an operator certificate. And for the managers there, it's a far more intense program. It talks about food safety, talks about receiving of products, correct temperatures, employee clothing. It, it's pretty intense. So those are available right now online at no charge. Um, food safety, because of, and I hate to say this, <laughs> the food sources today are more challenged than they've ever been. And with FDA and the inspectors going through the same thing that everybody else is going through, less employees, less inspections, the quality of the food may well be going down or the weaknesses of the suppliers handling the products correctly as they're going through the same labor problems you are. So a guy that was sweeping the floor may now be handling stocking the walk-ins. So you got to be careful. And you knowing your suppliers, and there's a whole list of things that the managers are re, uh, held accountable for, you know, receiving products. If you have a delivery, the delivery guy doesn't go into your walk-in cooler with his two-wheeler. You don't know where it's been. Mm -hmm. You don't know where his shoes have been. So there's a lot of rules and regulations for handling. But if you're going to the supermarket and buying your product and then bringing it into your restaurant, you've got control of it. So serve safe is one thing. And the ability to make sure that your employees understand, you know, if they're not feeling well, there are certain things that they should do and not do. Your management needs to know when they're producing a product. Let's say they're making tuna salad. There's a, there's a process for that. You can't walk away from a product and leave it on a counter for 20 minutes, go take cash, serve a couple of drinks, whatever, and then come back and make it. Can't do it. Everybody wears gloves. If you're in production, you're wearing an apron. When you go away from the site, you pull your gloves, you put new gloves on. There's requirements for washing hands and the like. All those things are important in food service delivery. So it's not about opening a can, grabbing a Wonder Bread, and making a sandwich. So... Um, that's serve safe and it's not there to scare you. I don't mean to make it sound so oppressive, but the rules are pretty sensitive. They're mostly consistent with what we believe in. It's just stating it. And, uh, so serve safe is really important and following the rules. And then you go over to HACCP and as you folks get, uh, in the pubs, bars and breweries, get more and more into food service. Um, HACCP is the, thing, the abbreviation for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. And what that means basically is from the field, wherever that field is, to where that product is supplied, to where it's supplied, to where it's delivered to a wholesaler or however it gets to you, from the wholesaler to your walk-in, from your walk-in to your production, and from production to your customer, there are control points that have to be followed. And HACCP plans are fairly expensive to do in high volume locations, you have to do them. Mm -hmm. You have to have a certified HACCP person to do it for you. And again, on my website, you can always contact me. I'm certified as a trainer and a proctor for NRA, and I'm certified by the FDA and HACCP 
uh, design. So we can give you at least directions on it. I can't say I can do your programs for you, but I can direct you on where to go. Uh, yeah. I can do it. But uh, anyways. Oh, so well, yeah. I, mean, I think the basis of uh, Serve Safe and HACCP. Yeah, the well, and the serve safe piece is really critical because for a lot of bars and pubs who are used to, you know, serving, you know, drinks and beer and things like that, this this move into into adopting food service sure. is right. is a is a new world. Like they've got they've got to start to think about. So, like you mentioned earlier, it's not about serving a meal at home. You're you're now yeah. opening up to a to a larger audience. Uh, that that ability and so when we when we yeah. think about the equipment and you know you know new people working you know the equipment that you talked about you know i i'm guessing is pretty easy to use very simple uh, most of them are knob controlled uh they are not touchscreen controlled so there's no programming and alike and most of the equipment has a cookbook with it, and we will have cookbooks up also for simple um, menus and alike on the Middleby, APW, Bakers, and Star website. So you'll be able to tap into uh, some good information. And, you know, as I said, the videos are coming out with well over 30 recipes, and we're not stopping there. Uh, but those are the quick ones just to get folks up and running. We'll get more intense. We have ones on doing a small dinner steak. We have breakfast on a panini you know, able to produce eggs over and sausage and all this, that's coming. And I don't know many bars, pubs, or breweries that serve breakfast, but if they do, great. But you can do a burger with an egg on it, which is quite nice, very simply. And you can buy, if you want to, you can buy frozen pre-cooked or you cook fresh yourself. And I go for the fresh, do it yourself. It, there's a there's a trade-off there a little bit. Yeah, you know, you a little cooked, extra time. Frozen, are safer, they're simpler to prepare, and most of the wait staff understand that, you know, you got a frozen product, you let it thaw, you shove it in, you, you heat it, you check it with a thermometer, which you have to have, and then you put together the simple meal, which is all the videos. I use fresh hamburger and I use frozen pre-cooked on doing sliders, perfect example. And uh, so you can buy it either way, the quality of the slider with fresh hamburger far better uh, than the frozen but if your skill set is such that you're concerned you can still serve that and it's an acceptable sandwich it's just not a phenomenal sandwich and adding things to a frozen example slider is you know adding a chutney adding cherry ketchup which is one of the recipes online which is phenomenal in flavoring uh, there's a number of things on there you can add to really bring up the quality of a frozen pre-cooked product. But my goal is to get you to the simplest, fresh product that will serve you best. Well, and I think one of the other things, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, having a thermometer is, is, is critical to making sure that you're at, at, at right temperature, sure. you know, and we've talked about the, the pieces of equipment being easy to start up, being easy to use. Are there some other, you know, adjacent products that, you know, the, these operators should think about when it comes to the equipment that they need to make sure that they've got to have the, a successful program. Oh, sure. And just first comment, um, index is not a sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> and you, I've been talking to some of the pubs and alike who have uh, started thinking about food service. And I mentioned sanitizer. Well, we have Windex. No way. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, that's that answer. Well, um, other equipment needed. Cleaning is so important, especially when you're using a small piece of equipment with multiple products on it. And the ability to clean with, uh, there are a number of food safe cleaners that can be used out there, uh, scrapers, uh, grill stones and alike. But responding after every cook to a quick clean on the unit, and I don't mean breaking it down, scrubbing it down, but just a scraper to have it there to scrape off any proteins that may be stuck on the, uh, the panini grill surface. Or if you spilled something, making sure that you have a sanitization bucket, which is a little red bucket where you'll see in, in a lot of restaurants with a fresh clean cloth and the chemical correctly in the water to sanitize the spot you're working on. 
making sure that you sanitize the spot after every production of food, uh, those types of things. So having cloth, having paper towels, having sanitizing liquid, scrapers and cleaners for your equipment, and setting up a cleaning procedure. Cleaning is so important to the maintenance of equipment. Now, you can't imagine, you may, Eric, you may see this often in your world. If you don't clean it, over time, it's going to break down. Yep. And the problem being is these guys are in such a situation now that they're depending upon a small piece of equipment to produce, let's say, 60% of their recipes. If it breaks down, they're dead. And they'll call in the local s supply guy to do the repair. And he shoves in a makeshift piece of equipment or a piece of uh, a part that just hasn't worked. And it's, you know, it'll, it'll get them through, but it'll blow in three days again. I can't stress, and this is not an advertisement for anybody, but I'm an OEM parts kind of guy. Yep. And, you know, there's not a lot of parts in these pieces of equipment. It may be a fuse. It may be a contact or it may be whatever. Guys, spend the extra dollars and get it done right. Um, because you're depending on it to keep your doors open and to please your customer base. There's nothing worse than going into a restaurant, sitting down, ordering a Guinness and ask for a bangers and mash. And they say, well, our grill isn't down, so I can't do bangers. Well, you just killed 75% of what I really wanted. Yep. And uh, so making sure that the equipment is up and running clean has been maintained correctly. And this is short term for you guys. I mean, you're starting new in it. You don't want to have to say after the second day, my equipment's down, which leads to choosing equipment with good warranties, making sure that there are local uh, service agents in your area. It could be a Cefesa member. It could be a number of different groups that the manufacturers support and they have access to parts and alike. And a lot of the equipment we're talking about is direct replacement. If it fails in a certain period of time, we just ship you a new piece of equipment. And uh, so your downtime is going to be very, very short. And a lot of manufacturers do that. It's not only us, but that's yeah. what we end up doing is we'll ship you something immediately uh, to replace it, uh, to get you up and running. But, uh, yeah, be be careful on what you choose and uh, make sure that – and. I hate to say this, but I got to say it, buy an all-American product, buy it from a company that's been here for years. And Baker's Pride has been here for 65 plus. BKI, who I work with also, is, you know, almost 70 years. Um, APW has been around forever. All of our companies have great history and we will take good care of you. Even now in the pandemic, we're we're taking care of folk and we, our customer service lines, our maintenance lines, and I handle a lot of calls. We'll take good care of you. That's yeah. the word from our sponsor. Now, let's talk <laughs> a little bit more about, about equipment. Just yeah. make sure you take care of it, cleaning it daily, making sure your employees understand how it works so that they're not injured, that they're not afraid to operate the equipment. And there's nothing better than praise. You know, you train your employee correctly on how to do the sandwich. You make available the videos we have. They produce that sandwich and then praise the ever-loving hell out of that employee for producing a great meal. There's nothing better to motivate a server than tell them how good a job they're doing. And they're in a new world. If they're going to be preparing sandwiches, let's say they're running 20 customers at lunch they'll probably be pulled into either dressing the plate or even producing the whole thing. They have to have pride in it and they want to deliver the best, best product they can, but they need to know how. Yeah. And know how is the manager or the owner's responsibility to make sure it happens. Oh, it's, you know, it's and, like, like great, you know, it's, the, it's like making a great Manhattan, you know, they've, they've been practiced at, at that piece of it. Now it's time for them to, to figure out the other side of it to make sure that the, the establishment continues on and, and does that. And, and you actually, you know, you said a couple of things uh, in, in that as well Is that, you know, first nothing, you know, minimizes the need for service calls, like cleaning your equipment on a daily basis. You know, that is, you know, job number one. And the, and I think the other piece that, you know, we, we want to emphasize for, you know, a lot of these facilities, they don't have kitchens. Odds are this is not being, necessarily produced back of house this is no. being produced 
in a area of the establishment that is a visible, b right. you know is going to require you know like you said that added sanitation, that added cleaning, and you know one of the things that a lot of the the research that we've been seeing from from customers is this idea of cleaning or sanitation is theater. You know, how do you take the stress level out of, of what we might be experiencing walking into an establishment for the first time, especially an establishment that may not have served food before. So really creating that ballet of cleaning to bring your customers in or back in is, is critical. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. And the story goes with that. You need to inspect to make sure you get what you expect. And managers can't be absent on this process. They need to be hands-on. And uh, as you say, it's in vision. I mean, some of the best restaurants I go to are grills. You actually can see the food being produced. And there's an excitement to that. And that excitement can be carried on in a bar, pub, or brewery by just putting it in front of it and taking good care of it, making sure that it's clean, as you said. And I'm not sure if uh, everybody knows what cleanliness has to do with the life of a piece of equipment. Let's review that just for a second. Mm -hmm. When you have a griddle or you have a piece of equipment and it's really dirty and the carbons that are burnt onto that surface are going to require you cranking the unit higher to get the cooks you expect. And what will happen over time is the thermostats are going to read that you want now 500 degrees when you actually are only delivering 400 degrees. There's a certain point where there's a meltdown, where the heat is held in the area below the cooking surface. And at a certain point, there's a meltdown. And cleanliness will cause that often. And a perfect example of that is build up on a water heater uh, cow rod. When all kinds of minerals come in and with the water and it gets around it and the thermostat's reading and wants to get 212 degrees, and the cow rod has to work harder and harder to deliver that 212 degrees. And at a certain point, it's outside its temperature range, and it melts down or it goes on high limiter. So those are service calls that can be stopped immediately mm-hmm. um, if someone was smart enough to just clean their equipment. Yeah, you know, and I've I've talked to countless service technicians who who have always come back in and said. Yeah, you know, they just they didn't clean it for six months. I don't know why they expected it to continue to function, you know, and, and, and things like that. You know, so you know, you know, and all manufacturers, you know, have you know the cleaning procedures sort of not sort of cleaning procedures specified for every piece of equipment, you know, and it's gonna be part of your your service manual, you know, and I you know, I think from my perspective, when you install, you know, these pieces of equipment, and even though startup might be, might be easy, you know, take the time to really understand how best to, to, to maintain that piece of equipment. And if that means calling, you know, Chef Frank and his team, you know, to help you walk through what is a really good cleaning program, you know, do it because it's going to, in the long run, be it'll set you up for success when you bring these new items uh, items Definitely. to life. And we have well over a hundred videos on operation and cleaning on the equipment. The favorite term is RTM. Read the manual, <laughs> and uh, it's it's hard to understand to the point of we suggest even when we talk to customers is make a simple wall hanging sheet, and. We do it for some of our larger customers where we'll actually laminate it. It goes in the work area and it's a, you know, it's the KISS method. No offense to employees who are operating it to keep it simple, guys. And it just shows you, here's what you do after you cook. Here's what you do at the end of the night. And here's what you do at the end of the week. And maybe end of the, you know, end of the month, here's what you do. So it gives you a direction that someone can follow daily, weekly, monthly, or whatever. And uh, and it's not that people don't want to do it. They just get busy doing other things. And yep. most of the employees are consumers in the end. 
and they know that they would not consume foods produced on a dirty piece of equipment. You just have to bring that to light to them. You have to, you have to respond to their position, which is your consumers like our customers are. Would you accept from there? Don't attack the employee, attack the problem. And once you get over that, I'm not saying to Judy, crying out loud, you, you, you cooked it on that, what are you, dumb? No, that's not <laughs> the way it works. No, it's not. Judy, would you, would you want something from that griddle? Well, the answer is going to be no. Well, how are we going to take care of that? And simply, if you've given them the correct directions and given them the tools, it's a simple step to that. And it never happens twice if you do it right. Nope, I would. I, I agree. Uh, you know, Frank, this has been a really, really good conversation. And you know, one of the things you know that I'd like to wrap up with is you talked a lot about simplicity and simplicity of ingredients, simplicity of the equipment that we're we're bringing to life with with for bars and, and pubs and to bring food service in. What are you know for you? What are one or two of the really big watchouts or you know? things that they should circle on their list of don't miss this step when they're thinking about, you know, starting up a, a food program to in their, in their establishments. Think of their community and who they're serving. Think of the ethnic potential for their market. And they, they know who came in pre pandemic. They know what they were dealing with and play to that using, if you're a, a pub or a brewery, using the products you fabricate like a, a brewery in their cooking and alike, use those products available to you that are simple and fresh, keep it easy and promote the hell out of it. Secondarily, and, and I mentioned you this earlier, Eric, um, the uh, we have a lot of people doing unique things in restaurants and pubs right now with And one of them is uh, we've got a pub in New England that does a uh, dinner party and they offer four or five items to their regular basic customers online. Customers choose it. The Uber delivers it. And then they have a Zoom that they call in on and they have dinner with a group of people consuming the same foods. And there's traditionally a benefit, whether it be financially for the food or it may be a small bottle of wine added to um the meal at no charge, but it really brings back the social atmosphere of restaurants. And when I look into today, uh, one of the New York papers published the top five things missed during the pandemic. Number one was family and get togethers, being with people. Number two was the ability to have dinner out with people. Well, we can solve that very simply. And this, this pub up here has done it very nicely, but use all of the electronics that we have available to us to make things go. Daily promotions, uh, mailing lists, uh, constant stirring of the pot, new fresh products, soups right now in New England, a big thing. We're coming into the fall and winter. You can buy some of the finest bagged frozen soups, and I'm not pushing them because, well, soups take a little longer to make, and there are some very good ones out there. A soup and sandwich special, tomato soup with grilled cheese, is like the best comfort food known to man. And uh, if you need it, I've mentioned, Eric, I do have a couple of cookbooks out. One is called American Comfort Foods, and it's available online. You don't have to buy the book. You can look at the recipes. So <laughs> is that is that is so the recipes, are they with with Hot Chef 911? Yeah, you can go on. You'll see the books on the right hand side. And as I say, you don't have to buy the book. I'm not selling the book. <laughs> I'm I'm selling comfort foods and the belief that it's right for this time. And you'll find simple things on there and soups and like and sandwich comparisons and doing pairing. I mean, how better in in a bar or a pub or a brewery to do a matched food and beverage? And there's so many options and there's so many manufacturers begging to be part of that from the brewery and distillation end, there shouldn't be a problem with with getting support on that. And uh, you know, oh. chef coming in and being in the facility and helping to facilitate the the pairings. And this all builds business for the future. This is, you know, this is this is a band aid, and there's a major surgery coming when when business comes back. Yeah. And uh, 
Yeah, right. So we got to look at that. So I would say stay fresh, respond quickly to customer needs, become ethnic, supplying the right foods to the right people, to your customer base. And the most important thing, make this fun. Yeah, food is fun. People want food is fun, and worked. I, you know, and I think is is people were also sort of at our limits of looking back. Let's look forward. Let's find the spirit of enjoyment again, and get out as best we can to have as much fun as we possibly can living in our our current our current situation. And you know, I couldn't agree agree more. You know, it's you know the the pairings piece. But just the creativity, you know, food is about, you know, about creativity. I have a lot of I have a lot of bartending friends and we always like to joke and say they're liquid chefs. You know, they're bringing they flavor are. together to create something truly interesting. So, you know, just just think of an extension. You know, you've got a great drink. Now you have the ability to bring in a great meal that pairs with that using, you know, real simple equipment that is easy to set up. And, you know, I want to close with this, Frank, where yep. can we find all these great videos that we talked about earlier in the podcast uh, that you're going to release on the 19th of October through Middleby? Okay. Right. It can be found on uh, bakerspride.com, apw.com or um, star manufacturing star hyphen MFG dot com and those will be the recipes there'll be a number of other products on there the psa will be available through the nra location and also through any one of the middleby groups and there are 36 of them <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we won't give you all those sites nope. now but uh, the, the bottom line to it is we want to make sure that all of our food service brothers who want to get into the game can do it simply and safely, and that we have compassion for you, we care for you, we understand that you've dr you've dreamed big dreams all your life and been able to deliver it, and now you've got the pandemic holding you down. Someday, the top is going to pop off, and until that time, be the best you can, deliver the best quality, the freshest product, have the most fun because the most fun comes when you're challenged, and you're challenged right now. Make it fun. Make it fresh, flavorful. Remember, culinary pyrotechnics. Flavor is so important. All right. Well, and it just becomes infectious, and you know, brings a smile to everybody's face. Frank, don't mention infection at this time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it it imbibes a spirit of joy. <laughs> yes, it does. Food is love, my friend. It and is right indeed. Now we need all the love we can get. Yes, I can't agree more. Frank, thank you so much. Again, this was a fantastic conversation. And for those who are new to the PartsCast, please subscribe to the PartsCast. You can find us anywhere you download your podcast today. Apple, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it, we can be found there. And until the next PartsCast, you know, thanks for listening. <laughs>